All right. Good morning. Welcome to Oak Bridge City. Make some noise if you're here with us last week uh, for Easter Sunday. Yeah, awesome. Um, it was pretty fun. We had over 100 more people than we did two years ago uh, for our first kind of Easter Sunday at Oak Bridge City. And so it was cool um, seeing more and more people trickle in on Sunday mornings to hear about the greatest story uh, ever told. And so we're excited to continue to build the church and hopefully see more people come. And so uh, if you call Oak Bridge City home, we would really encourage you to continue to invite and do your best to, uh, yeah, try and expand what God is doing here in this area and in this region and, um, and try and expand your influence in your friend circle and kind of the areas that God has entrusted you to, to lead and, and impact. Um, and so kind of a hard turn from there onto a really fun announcement. Uh, if you were, if you're parked in the bank parking lot across the street, uh, they're going to actually pave that parking lot today. Never mind. You can stay there. False alarm. Uh, so y'all are y'all are good. Uh, raise your hand if you were parked in the bank parking lot. Okay, I'm sorry that your heart started pounding a little bit extra. Um, Anyways, if it's your first time, uh, we're having some first timers every week. We would love to meet you right after service. And so head out these doors and uh, we have some people wearing a shirt that says, how can I help? They'd love to just say hi, tell you thanks for being here, get some information from you and get, and most importantly, give you a free t-shirt. And so do not leave uh, today without just walking right out these doors and at least just introducing yourself to us. We'd love to We'd love to meet you. Um, and you'll notice we do some things differently here. So we don't take an offering in this service. If it's your first time, if you're visiting with us, uh, we ask that you not give. We ask that you sit back, relax, and just enjoy the service. But if you call Oak Bridge your home, uh, if this is your church, if you believe in the mission, uh, we would encourage you to give and to give cheerfully uh, and joyfully, believing that God's going to use it to make a big difference in the lives of people. And uh, there are joy boxes located all throughout the building, and you can also give online, which I think most people do nowadays. And so we'd love for you to give um, and, uh, and see what God does with, with, with that. Uh, tonight, if you're a middle school or high school student, we have The Edge at our Arnold location. We're actually having three students be baptized tonight, which we're excited about. Yeah, um, that was really the, the prayer for our whole semester is that just one kid uh, would, would either come to know Christ or maybe a kid who's, who's known Jesus for a long time would step up and be baptized, uh, one of which is actually my brother, and so I'm excited about that. Yeah, so I've been praying for him, and so we're, uh, we're fired up about that. And so if you're middle school or high school, we're going to kind of have a party tonight. We're having some blow-ups out in the parking lot, um, and then we're going to do a little baptism service afterwards, and so we'd love for you to join. I think it'd be a great time to come uh, and, and check us out. And uh, with that said, we'll kind of share some more stuff uh, later on in the service, but I'm excited to worship. And so why don't you guys stand up and I'm going to say a prayer for us before we uh, dive in. God, we love you. We're so grateful for who you are, for what you've done uh, for your people, for the gathering of believers that's been going on for 2,000 years. And right now, as we speak uh, in different parts of the globe, people are gathering, singing, worshiping, lifting up really the same anthems we're singing today. And so God, I just pray that we don't miss this opportunity uh, to meet with you, the creator of the universe. I pray that we lean in. I love your promise in the book of James where if we draw near to you, if we just lean in, if we seek you, uh, you'll draw near uh, to us. And Lord, I pray, I, I just pray that we, um, that we do that this morning, that you're glorified, that you're lifted up, that we would sing and that we would sing loud because you're worthy of it. And it's in Jesus' name. Uh, amen. Amen. Fix your eyes on this one truth 
God is madly in love with you. So take courage, hold on, be strong. Remember where our help comes from.
Would you all take a few moments? You guys can take a seat. And why don't you take a few moments on your own uh, to go to God in prayer, to reflect on the words we just sang, um, to just be with God for a little bit. So we're going to 
take of the Lord's Supper together. So if you would call yourself a follower of Christ or believer in Jesus, you should, uh, you'll find a cup with everything in it underneath your chair there. So let's, let's take of the bread together, which Christ said was his body broken for us. In the cup, which Christ said was his blood, the blood of the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sins. So let's take it. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for that truth that we have a new covenant with you through Christ. That that level of perfection you demanded uh, was achieved by him. And so now his righteousness is our righteousness if we believe in him and trust in him. Father, we thank you so much for that, for that grace that we've been singing about, that we've been reflecting on all morning. Uh, Father, let us not take it for granted. Let us not take it cheaply, uh, but surrender everything we have back to you, Lord, Um, because you demand it all. So we thank you so much for Christ. We thank you so much for the forgiveness and righteousness we have through him. It's in his name we pray. Amen. 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 Our kiddos can head on back uh, to the kids' ministry. Your teachers are in the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Um, Well, hey, we're going to start with a little participation here. Um, I'm just in a good mood this morning. It's Master Sunday. Um, And so we're going to chat just for a couple minutes before we dive into the talk. So this could really be anything. It could be a restaurant. It could be a landmark, it could be an entertainment venue, it could be a park, it could be a golf course, of of course. Um, It could be anything uh, that comes to mind. And and so I want you to just yell it out, actually. You don't, this isn't a classroom, you don't even need to raise your hand. And so what's your favorite thing to do in St. Louis? I just want to hear some stuff. Favorite thing to do in St. Louis? Cardinal games, golf. Ted Drew's Waffle House. It's the lamest answer I've ever heard in my life. Um, I think those are all over the country. Um, (laughs) I'm just kidding. I'm I'm sorry. Um, Anybody else? Anybody else? Yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't hear. Texas Roadhouse. Love it. Peanuts. Um, amazing. You know, I, I think St. Louis is a great place to live. I think it's the surrounding areas of St. Louis, I think there's a lot of cool stuff to do, a lot of great restaurants to eat, a lot of cool places to see, a lot of cool things to partake of. And you know, one place that I have to go to every time one of my friends from different part of the country comes in for the first time, it's, uh, we have to go to a place that is unlike any other place in the world. In fact, it makes lists like all the time for like, there's no other place like it. Y- y'all know what I'm, maybe know what I'm talking about. Um, any come to mind at all, anything? City Museum. City Museum, it's unbelievable. You walk in and you're like, either the person who created this is the most creative human in the world or he was high on something very strong because it is unbelievable like what you see when you walk in. And, and there are just so many options. You have slides. In fact, I'm 29 and I still dress the part when I go to the city museum. I'll wear my most slippery sweatpants and a Nike Windrunner jacket because I want to slide really fast down the slides. There are like secret passageways and tunnels. There's some crazy designs. There's like a small little aquarium type deal. There's a playground up super high in the air. There's an outdoor area with the Ferris wheel. I mean, we could go on and on and on. There's a place for parkour, right? Parkour. I don't do parkour unless I go to the city museum. Then I'm jumping around like a wild man, right? Like uh, you walk in, you're so excited. There's a ton of stuff to do. And literally you kind of ask this question like, what should we do? There's so many options. What, what do we do with this? Like you walk in, there's just, you know, there's a wedding venue there. There's a bar. There's a place to watch TV. I mean, there's just so many different things. What should we, what should we do? It's almost like going to, you know, TGI Fridays or the Cheesecake Factory and looking at the menu, right? Like there are just so many options. And I know what some of you are thinking. You're like, 
Really, Josh? I thought we were talking about St. Louis. Those, plays aren't, those places aren't local. Oh, give me a break. Goodness gracious, millennials, right? And so let's just, let's, let's, let's check. Okay, Cybergs or Circle 7 Ranch. Okay, some great restaurants. For me, there's just so many options, right? So what do you get? I have, I have a hard time making decisions. I do. Um, I get a little overwhelmed. It, it drives my wife nuts in a lot of areas because she'll be like, hey, I'm going to the grocery store. What do you want? And I just get stressed. I'm like, I don't know. You pick. Surprise me. There are just so many things. And so we'll go out to eat and raise your hand if you're kind of like this, where what you order is kind of dependent on what your date is going to order, right? Because you're going to probably take a bite or two of what they're getting and you don't want to get something similar. And so every time we go out to eat, Abby's like, hey, what are you, what are you going to get? And almost every time I'm like, I'm just going to wing it. I'm going to wing it. There's like five things in my mind. So when the server comes, whatever I say is, is, is kind of what I'm going to do. I, I don't know. I'm just so excited. What should I get? What should I, what should I do here? And I think to some extent, okay, th- this should be, this should kind of be how we feel a little bit when we experience the grandeur of the gospel message for the first time ever. Like when we hear of all the implications of what Jesus did, did for us. Wait, what? Jesus died for me? Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus loved me before the world even began. Jesus says that there's an inheritance for me that will never spoil or perish or fade. Jesus says he can use me to, to, to do some things that echo into all of eternity. In fact, I believe as Jesus followers, we really should ask this question, what should we do with this? For the last eight weeks or 10 weeks, however long we've been back, I don't know, I haven't kept track of time since last March, right? But, but we've been back, we've been going through First Peter, we've been talking about a bunch of things, and honestly, I hope at least to some extent, we've asked the question, what should we do with this? When we see the good news of Jesus, when we hear about the grace of God and the love of God, I think it should beg the question, what should we do with this? I hope that to some extent we're convicted of sin and our eyes are open to the reality of our own brokenness that leads us to beg the question, what should we do with this? I hope that we look out and see the brokenness of our world and the massive need for Jesus to, 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 to invade our globe and into the lives of individuals to the point where we say, hey, as carriers of this message, what should we do with this? In fact, as we come to church, when we hear worship songs, when we read our Bibles at home, when we hear sermons, when we When we come to the gathering, I hope at least to some extent, not necessarily in a burdensome way, but in this exciting, like there's just so many implications here. I hope we would beg the question, you know, what, what do we do with this? What, what do we do with this? And this is really the question that I think really the church has been trying to answer for, for 2000 years. What are the implications of this practically? And so for the next four or five weeks, we're diving into a series titled Church. What shall we do? Where do we go from here? We've heard the message. Jesus died. Jesus rose from the dead. What are some practical things that we need to do? What are some lifestyle deals that need to take place for us as people who claim to be Christians? And if you're not a Christian, at least maybe you can peer into some different things as to what we're called to do as Christians. as believers. And so we're actually going to look at the first sermon, and I wish we had time to read the whole thing and talk about it, but it's pretty long. We're, but we're going to chat about the first sermon, like post ascension uh, of Jesus into heaven uh, in the book of Acts, chapter 2. And, uh, and so we're just going to kind of recap what Peter says, all right? And this is why I love preaching. We're going to see why here in just a moment. And he starts out with this he, he says, Listen carefully to this. This is what he says. Listen carefully to this. You know, it's funny. Uh, I watch, I go back and I watch, uh, it's painful, but I watch myself preach uh, every week online on YouTube. And I've done it really since I began. And um, I don't do it to be like, oh, how was the sermon? I practiced the sermon a bunch beforehand. And so I already know what I'm going to say pretty much to, to the T, but I watch it because in regards to public speaking, sometimes you just develop some bad habits, right? And so I want to kind of watch and just make sure I'm not doing anything silly. For a while before COVID, I remember I didn't even recognize this for weeks, but my dad came to me and said, hey man, every time you say something serious, you like look up to the top right of the room, like every time. And so I'd watch and every time it got like kind of quiet or still, or I would just like look like this. 
And so I've just kind of developed some habits every now and then. And so I watched just to change it. And so last week, I apologize if you were at our 10 a.m. service um, because I was so excited. I was so excited to preach and I was excited to talk about the resurrection, especially for people who don't know God. And so anytime I said something that I was kind of excited about, which was a lot last week, I would say, hear me on this. Hear me on this. I said it like a hundred times. Hear me on this. Hear me on this. If I were you, I would have been like, you're so ba- you're so annoying, right? And so I apologize. That was a bad habit. Now you're going to be like evaluating. I- I'm going to try not to say it this morning. Uh, but this is really what Peter's doing here. Peter's saying, hey, I'm about to say something exciting, important. Hear me on this. Listen carefully to this. And then he dives into the sermon. And this is pretty powerful stuff. He says, God will pour out his spirit on people from every nation, tribe, and tongue. He's speaking to mostly Jews. And he's like, hey, it's not just about the Jewish people anymore. Like the, the, the days that the prophets wrote about, they're, they're here now. God's going to pour out his spirit on people from all over the globe. Young, old, male and female will experience the grace of God and be used by him to build his kingdom. In fact, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's how kind of the beginning of the sermon starts off. And so it's powerful and the hearers are like, whoa, he's coming in hot. This is borderline offensive, but this is, this is pretty good news if it's true. And then he goes on, hey, Jesus sent from God performed signs and wonders that you yourselves saw. And while God had this planned all along, you, you, maybe he's calling people by name, you killed him. You killed him. They have to be asking themselves the question here, what happened to Peter? What happened, what happened to Pete? Just, just a few days ago, he, he's denying Jesus to teenage girls. Now he's looking Jesus, you know, murderers essentially in the eye and saying, you are the ones who killed him. And he makes it clear God had this ordained from the beginning of time. And then he says he was raised to life because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. He says, we are all witnesses of this. He's seated at the right hand of God. He's given his spirit to all who believe, and we are sure that the man you killed is both Lord and Messiah. It's a pretty good sermon, right? Like, that's a pretty powerful first sermon that we see in in the church. And uh, and this is really kind of why I love preaching, and I hope to some extent I'm doing this forever, because people respond. When the people heard this, They were cut to the heart. When the word of God is preached, when the truth of God is proclaimed, something takes place in the lives of people. Something takes place in the lives of people who not only believe, but people who are outside of the faith. The word of God is is powerful. It's it's powerful. And we actually see this in 1 Corinthians um, chapter 7. We're going to talk about the gathering over the next few weeks, and I believe the importance of the gathering of believers. And I love this passage that I've studied and thought about a lot, really since the beginning of of COVID. And it, it says this, it's 1 Corinthians 14, but if all of you are prophesying, proclaiming the word of God, and unbelievers or people who don't understand these things come into your meeting, they will be convicted of sin and judged by what you say. You aren't even going to call them by name. It's just the word of God is powerful. It cuts to the heart. As they listen, their secret thoughts will be exposed and they will fall to their knees and worship God, declaring God is truly here among you. How, how powerful is that? This happens in this room every now and then, I hope. This is what I pray for every Sunday. This is what I pray for over at our Arnold location. This is what I pray for, for the journey and for the cross point and for ministry friends all across the country and for churches all over the globe, that the word of God is preached boldly, confidently to where people come in and they're convicted of sin and they're cut to the heart. And essentially they ask the question, what, what, what do we do with this? This is encouraging. The gathering of believers is not just important for the believers to be built up. But the gathering has been used for thousands of years to reach unbelievers. 
This is exciting to me. This, is, this fires me up. This is essentially why we've designed our church the way we've designed it. And I want to preach boldly, and I want to talk about sin, and I want to talk in such a way where people are convicted of their need for a Savior. But I, I, I just trust and I believe that even if you're in the room today and you haven't taken that step, it could happen for you. The Word of God's that powerful. And this happens for the hearers who are listening to the first sermon given by Peter. They're cut to the heart. And then they ask, brothers, what shall we do? If all of this is true, I mean, if we killed the author of life, if we killed Lord and Messiah, if, if, he's a, if he saves all who call on his name, I, what do we do with this? And then Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So there are really two action steps there that Peter gives to those who have heard the gospel, which if you've been coming here for the last eight or so weeks, I, heard, I believe that you've heard the gospel message clearly and, and, and plainly. And I hope that you're at least begging the question, whether you're a believer or whether you're an unbeliever, what do we... What do we do with this? And Peter gives, again, two action steps. The first one he gives is repent. We're going to give kind of a theological definition here in a moment, but really it just means to change your mind, to, to turn around. And we see that in this passage, and we see all throughout the New Testament, that repentance precedes forgiveness. If you want to be forgiven of your sins, if you want to be accepted and approved by God as holy and blameless to where you can go into the presence of God, you need to repent of your sin and turn towards Jesus, not just as Savior, but as Lord and as Master. Repentance precedes forgiveness. We see this in Acts chapter 2, and we see this as a theme all throughout the New Testament. But we also see all throughout the Bible that repentance is a lifestyle for the church. We see this, you know, charge to the church in Corinth. We see this as a theme through, for the old covenant people of God to repent and return, to turn back towards their God. We see this in the book of Revelation where Jesus charges the seven churches to repent, to return. This is a churchy word, and I'm going to do my best to chat about it here, but repentance is not just a one-time decision. Repentance is not just a one-time thing where you're like, yep, I repent, and I believe, I'm baptized, I'm forgiven, we're good. If the message of sin and salvation and sanctification, if all of this is real, if all the implications of what we talked about for the last eight or so weeks is true, this needs to be a posture this needs to be an everyday reality. And I love what Dr. Tony Evans says about repentance. He says it's this. It's the internal resolve and determination to turn from your sin. It's this internal resolve and determination, this struggle. I'm going to do whatever it takes to turn from my sin and to turn towards Jesus. So what is repentance? And I'm going to kind of chat about it here briefly. For those of us who don't know Christ, who have never repented, and for those of us who are in the family of God, we're believers, we've done that, but maybe we've, you know, maybe we've got some sin in our lives where like it just is what it is. And so we're just going to chat real quick about what repentance is throughout the scriptures. The first one is this. There needs to be a recognition of sin. There needs to be a recognition of sin. There does. If there's no sin in your life, if, if there's no error in your life, if there's, if there's no disobedience in your life, if there's no missing the mark or, 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 or offending, again, God's glorious standard that was set, then what do you need to turn from? I know this should be obvious, but it really isn't anymore. There needs to be a recognition of sin, not just in the world, but in my heart and in my life. And it needs to be, it needs to be recognized on a regular basis as a believer. First John says that if we confess our sins, 
If we confess our sins to God, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. The, the Greek word for confess there is to say the same thing. What John is saying is, is you need to say the same thing about your sin as what God says about your sin. You need to agree with God about the reality that we have sin in our life that hurts people and offends the creator of the universe and essentially it's what hung Jesus to a cross. He's the one we need to agree with in regards to our sin. Next, there needs to be remorse over what we recognized. There needs to be some remorse over what we recognized in our life that does not line up with the standard that God has set. If the message of Good Friday is true, I mean, if our sin is what hung our Savior, Jesus, to a cross, if he bore our sin in his body on the tree, if Jesus paid for your sin, there needs to be a, a sense of sorrow and remorse over what our sin does. And hear me on this. When you sin, there it is, first time, hear me on this. Um, if, if you sin against a brother or a sister or a family member or whatever, I hope that should, that should bring about some remorse as well. I hurt someone I love. I hurt someone I care about. That should bother us to some extent. But every sin... Every sin we commit offends the creator of the universe. And there should be some remorse over the recognition of sin in our lives. We chatted about this somewhat recently, so I'm going to read through it quick. But I love what Paul says to the church in Corinth. He just gets done. He's called him out on sin a while back. And then he writes a letter and he says, Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I don't regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I'm happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow, because your remorse led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. Godly sorrow leads to repentance and repentance leads to life. Repentance leads to forgiveness. Without repentance ever, we, we, we stay apart from God forever. Repentance is what precedes forgiveness. But I think oftentimes as believers, we've repented once or maybe many times, but there's an unrepentant area of our life, and that keeps us from enjoying the salvation that was accomplished in the first place. In unrepentant heart, I'm not saying you, I'm not saying you won't be saved. I'm not saying that you're not in. That's a massive discussion. I, I believe that once you repent, you're forgiven. But I believe there's a way to, to have, to have access to salvation and just not really enjoy the benefits of it. And so Paul's saying that when you repent, when you have godly sorrow, you, you experience life and a life with no regret, a life of enjoyment in the kingdom of God. And do you notice he contrasts godly sorrow and worldly sorrow? And do you know what worldly sorrow is? I got caught. I got caught. And so it's not, man, it's not, it's not sorrowful over what you did. It's not, it's not really having sorrow over the sin in your life and how that sin hurts people and offends God. It's just, well, I got caught and people know now and my ego's busted a little bit. And, 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 and hear me on this. If, 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 we aren't, if we aren't sorrowful over what we did, eventually we're, we're just going to do it again. If there's no remorse over the sin in our life, we're, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're just going to keep doing it. Do you know what worldly sorrow is? Essentially, it's feeling sorry for yourself. It's, it's I can't believe I did this again. I can't believe they know. I can't believe I got caught. I can't believe my wife found out. I can't believe my friends found out. I can't believe that my anger outburst happened. And now, again, I'm just, people. all the people know 
Or maybe it's just, I keep doing this and I'm never going to change. It's just so frustrating. I've been struggling with this. I've been dealing with this forever. And uh, it's, just, it's just bringing so much pain to me. Worldly, worldly sorrow focuses on self. Godly sorrow focuses on God and others. And so you need a recognition of sin. You need remorse over what you've recognized. And then third, you, there needs to be a reversal. There needs to be a decision to reverse it. There, there needs to be a change. As believers in Jesus, as, as people who have issues in our lives that are inconsistent with the glory of God and the standard that God has set, which all of us do, let's be real, there are steps that need to be taken. There are habits that need to be developed. There are, there are confessions that need to be made. There are apologies that need to be sent out. There, there are steps that need to be taken for us to actually turn from our sin and turn in a different direction. It, if there's no external change of direction in your life, then you have to ask yourself if there is an internal resolve to turn from your sin at all. It, if this message is not changing some things, if the message of Jesus doesn't compel us to become more like Jesus over time, and it's a process, I'm not saying you snap your fingers, but, but the apostles tell us to evaluate our faith. Where are we at with this? Are we... Are we repentant? Is there an internal resolve? And is that evidenced by some fruit in our lives? Are we planting roots to where there's a little bit of fruit of change, of growth in our lives where we're saying, yes, I'm repentant. I wasn't going to say this, but maybe you're in a relationship with someone, a boyfriend or a girlfriend, Someone in your life and they've caused harm and they've caused pain and they've said sorry over and over and over and over again. I'm sorry. I'm going to change. I'm going to change. Well, if they aren't taking any steps to actually, you might just want to get out. You can be talking the talk a whole lot. Yeah, I'm going to change. I'm going to change. I'm going to change. But if you just stay going in this direction, talk is cheap. There needs to be some steps taken to actually reverse course. I, I, yesterday, I went and got a treadmill. And so, um, just in time for nice weather to where we can start running outside, we decided to go get a treadmill uh, to put in our basement. And so, I drove down to High Ridge to, uh, to get a treadmill from one of Abby's uh, old co-workers. And so, I go down there. It's like a 30-minute drive. And we're going to get fit, you know, for the summer and all that. And so, so we so we get the we get the treadmill and her husband comes out helps me put put it in the in the car and it takes about 30 seconds and I was so excited to get home to just smash the leftover Emos pizza I had from the night before right and so I'm getting the treadmill so I can eat the pizza as balance right and so um so I'm I'm all excited I didn't even turn on the maps okay and so it was down in High Ridge. I'd never really been there. And so I turn and I turn onto Highway 21. And instead of going north on 21, I turn south on 21. And so I'm driving for like 10 or 15 minutes. I'm actually talking on the phone. And I'm like, I've never seen these buildings before. Uh, I didn't see these buildings on the way here. And I quickly realized I am going in the wrong direction. I'm going in the wrong direction. And so I actually call Abby. She had the pizza in the oven. I'm like, you can turn the oven off. It's going to be a lot longer. I'm going to be there in about 45 minutes. I was very frustrated. But do you know the most important part of, of me actually getting to where I wanted to go? It wasn't the recognition. That was important. I needed to recognize it, but that wasn't it. It wasn't the remorse, which it was there. I wanted pizza, right? It's like, ugh. It was actually changing direction. It's like, hey, I'm going to get off on this exit. I'm going to turn around. And I'm going to go where I want to go. I think it's really easy for us as Christians, as, as non-Christians, to be, to be set on a path that we know it's not the right direction. We're, we're, this, this sin, this unrepentance, this 
This way of life that we're on is leading us down a road that leads to destruction. It's leading us nowhere good. But it's so easy to, you know, we're driving down the road, we're going the wrong direction, and then we see an exit for us to turn around, and we're like, ah, there will be another one up here. There will be another one in a mile or two. I'll turn around then. We have to at least evaluate ourselves. Hey, if, if we continue to skip the exits, maybe we don't want the Emo's pizza at all. Maybe there's just this lack of internal resolve to actually live the life that God has called us to live. So here's what we learn about repentance. Repentance for the first time brings us to salvation. Turning from your sin, turning towards Jesus brings us salvation. Repentance over time allows us to enjoy our salvation. And so let me ask you the question. Do you need to repent for the first time ever? Do you need to turn towards Jesus as both Lord and Savior for the first time ever? You've been coming to church for a long time. You've heard the message. Maybe you haven't been coming to church for a long time, but you know there's just this reality in your world where there's something that's just off. There's something wrong. It's not as it should be. I need a Savior. I need to turn towards Him. Is that you? Or if you're a Christian, do you need to repent again? Is there something in your life that you haven't confessed? Is there something in your life that's been festering? Is there a direction that you're taking right now and you know it's not the direction that God wants for you? Is, is that you? And what's that look like? What apology needs to be made? What, what do you need to confess to God? What do you need to struggle with? What do you need some accountability for? What steps do you need to take to actually get on the course that God has created you to, to, to be on. You know, I mentioned earlier um, how in Revelation, Jesus calls churches to repent and return a whole lot. Repent, turn around, turn towards Jesus. And I, I love this. This was very convicting for me because I think a lot of times as Christians, um, there might not be this like deep, dark, Sin, like when I say, what is it that you need to repent of? Maybe there isn't this like super shameful thing that comes to mind. Maybe there is, and if that's, if that, then repent of it. You can be forgiven. You're welcome here. But I think as you grow and grow and grow with Jesus, maybe the stuff that you really, 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 really struggled with a long time ago, it just isn't really there anymore, and you can begin to be like, I'm good. But I love what I love what Jesus says to the church in Ephesus. He actually talks about how, hey, you guys have kind of stayed the course. You've, you've made your way through persecution. You've done a lot of good stuff. But he says this, I hold this against you. You've forsaken the love you had at first. Other translations say you've forsaken your first love. Consider how far you've fallen. Repent and do the things that you did at first. If you do not repent of losing your first love, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. As you study this passage, as you look at this, most of the time scholars bring you back to Ephesians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 2 and Ephesians chapter 3 that talks about the grace of God. You've been saved by grace through faith. You've been adopted into the family of God. You've been loved by the creator of the universe. He purchased you with his blood. And, and, and theologians believe that Jesus is saying, you used to be so excited about that. That led you to worship. That led you to service. You joyfully gave. You joyfully worshiped. You joyfully served your community in light of what Jesus did for you. Everything, everything revolved around the good news of Jesus. You were in love with him. You were in love with me. You love to meet with me. You love to sing to me. You love to serve me. You loved the gospel message of Jesus. 
And now you're still doing certain things and you've actually done some really good work. But if, it's, if it isn't centered, if, it's, if it isn't focused on the good news of Jesus, you've lost sight of what's most important. And, and, and this was so convicting for me because honestly, 2020, 2021, I don't know if anybody else, at times it's just been so frustrating. And there are conversations I've had and there are different things and there are disagreements and there are all these different things and it's just been... It's been so frustrating. And, and there have been, again, like, ah, I want to pull my hair out of my head sometimes. And then before you know it, you're, fo- honestly, this was so convicting for me as I'm reading this passage and thinking about repentance. And it was, hey, Josh, you need to repent. Because maybe at times you've lost sight of what's most important. You've entertained too many conversations that really don't mean a whole lot at all. You've lost sight of what's most important, and it is very clear. What's most important is Jesus. His grace. His love. His power. For me. And for the world. Maybe that's just for me. But maybe it's also for you. Really, I believe the root of sin is just valuing something else more than you value Jesus. The root of sin is loving something else more than you love Jesus. Oftentimes, what we need to repent of is losing sight of what's most important. Repent. Acts chapter 3 says that when we return and repent, times of refreshing will come. You know, oftentimes we we quote the prophet... um, the, the Old Testament prophet where it talks about how we need to repent and pray and turn from our wicked ways and then God will heal our land. And oftentimes we just take this out of context and we're like, America needs to repent. The country needs to repent. Everyone needs to repent. That, that message is for the people of God. That message is for, is, for the, is for the nation of Israel. That message is for the church. We need to have a posture of repentance as the people of God. So the first is repent. Second is be baptized. Be baptized. In fact, this is one of two ordinances that Jesus ordains for the church. The first is the Lord's Supper. We took that just a little bit ago. And then the second is baptism. Baptism. Peter makes it very clear. I believe it's clear all throughout the book of Acts. You believe and then you're baptized. You you believe, you repent, and then you're baptized. I love what an article from the Gospel Coalition says um, about baptism. It says the New Testament doesn't know of a Christian who's also not baptized. And this is evidence all throughout the book of Acts post-Pentecost. When people would believe, most of the time immediately, if there was a body of water, they would be baptized. They would be baptized. In fact, that, that's an article that you, it's just titled Water Baptism on the Gospel Coalition. I, I think it would outline very well um, some different stances on baptism, and I think it's pretty clear from that, uh, you know, what would be um, kind of the biblical stance on what we believe baptism is here at Oak Bridge. But from Pentecost on, everyone who came to believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior was baptized following belief. And so this is what Peter charges all of these hearers. Hey, if you haven't been baptized, be be baptized. And this always brings up the question, what, what if I was baptized as a baby? And here's what we always say. We love that your, we love that your parents loved you enough to, 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 to do that. We think that was a loving act. They, 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 thought that was a, they thought that was the right thing for you. So we honor your parents. We love that your parents loved you and, and want to raise you in the church and all these different things. But I don't see an, I, like, you don't really see an infant baptism in the scriptures. It's impossible to repent of something as an infant. I, I, baptism follows repentance and belief. And there are some different stances on this, and I'd be more than willing to have a conversation, but this is, 
This is where we land as a church. And so this is a refresher for those of us who have been baptized and are in this church. And this is just kind of a challenge and a charge for you if you haven't. Be baptized. And so here are a couple things we believe about baptism. Baptism is the primary way to declare publicly our faith in Christ. It is. And in the age of altar calls and different things, which I'm not hating on, I should probably do more invitations to come to know Christ, but I think maybe this, this is replaced. It's like, well, I said a prayer and I walked up to the front and I did this, but we see the ordinance that Jesus brings about. This is how you publicly confess that Jesus is your Lord and your Savior. This is, this is the model in the New Testament. We're having a few baptisms tonight at the edge, and I had, a couple, I had a conversation on Zoom with their parents and the students this week, and it was so fun, one, seeing their parents beaming. They were so excited uh, that their students uh, have come to know Christ, and they're making this decision. And I got fired up at one point and I was like, hey, you know, I don't really care what you say. You can get up there and just say, Jesus is my Lord and Savior and I want to be baptized. But I'm excited because you get to boldly in front of your peers, in front of the church, in front of the volunteers, get up and say, Jesus saved me. I know Jesus. Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. This is, this is a beautiful privilege and I hope that it, I hope that it inspires your peers. And I hope maybe even it convicts some of your peers. And I hope that it encourages the church and the volunteers who are giving and are showing up every week and realizing that God's still working and God's still moving. This is what we do. We publicly confess to the church that Jesus is Lord and Savior. But baptism is also an external sign that signifies an internal reality. We are, we are identifying with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. When we go under the water, we're saying, hey, the old me is gone. The old me is gone. I've been crucified with Christ. Though my sins are like scarlet, I am being washed white as snow. And when you come out of the water, you're saying, just as Christ is risen, I, I will rise as well. I'm a new creation. I'm white as snow. We're really telling the gospel story through baptism. It's the greatest story ever told. And so let me ask you the question, are you baptized? Christian, are you baptized? And if not, we would love to hear you publicly confess maybe something that took place in private. We would love to see the external sign of what's taken place internally in your life. We would love to celebrate the greatest message of all time along with all of heaven. We would love that. We would love for you to be baptized. We would love to be reminded of why we do what we do. So that people come to know Christ and come to a saving faith and are built up. This is part of the Great Commission. We make disciples and we, we baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And so what do we do with this? We repent. And we repent again. And then for those of us who haven't yet, let's, let's be baptized. Maybe some of you know this is coming. There's a sign up. <laughs> right outside the doors at the info desk and you can sign up I'll call you this week we'll have a conversation and we'll get you dunked and we'll celebrate and then it'll lead us to worship and it'll lead us again to understanding that Jesus is alive the message we sang about last week is the message that we sing about this week Jesus is alive and if he's alive he's working and he's moving and so we'd love to celebrate with you. And so uh, I don't know where this message is going to land with, with you. It's kind of all over the place, actually, now that I think about it. And, uh, and so we're just going to give you a moment to reflect and to pray um, about the passage that we just read in Acts chapter 2.
Father, may we be a repentant people, people who are quick to say we're sorry to you, the God of the universe, and also to those that maybe we've sinned against and hurt. May we be a humble, repentant people who acknowledge that we fall short of the standard that you have set. And our sin hurts people. And our sin is what hung you to a cross. And we are to turn from it at every turn. Father, maybe there's someone in the room and there's something in their life. There's maybe a complacency. There's maybe an action. There's maybe something that's going on behind closed doors and they've just let it fester and they kind of like it and it's this tension. And at times they get sad, but there really isn't a struggle. Lord, I pray that today, maybe just for one person, there can begin a struggle with sin this desire and this resolve to actually turn from the way that we're going and turn towards the direction that Jesus has for us. And Lord, you say that as we repent, so there's refreshing and this is fertile ground for you to move. And so um, pray this over all of us today in this space. I pray this for churches across St. Louis. I pray this for churches across our globe um, that we could have a contrite heart, a broken spirit, understanding that we are to turn from our wicked ways and turn towards you. Um, and God, I pray that um, maybe someone repents today for the first time ever. Maybe even now in this moment that they say, I'm just going to, I'm just going to make the decision. And Lord, I pray that people make the decision to be baptized, to step out in faith and to say, I'm going to publicly confess that Jesus is Lord and Savior. And God, I pray that as a church, we come alongside them and celebrate and are led by you to help um, build people up in, in the faith. Um, we trust you. We're grateful for you. Um, and Lord, I pray that, that this message is not twisted to the point where Christianity is now behavior oriented or works based, or I got to do certain things, or I got to do that to be accepted. No, it's a message of belief and repentance where we make a decision that you are who you say you are. We agree with you about what our sin is. We agree with you about who you say you are, and we can rest in the reality that we are saved. We can rest in the reality that we're free. We can rest in the reality that we are forgiven. But if we want to enjoy the benefits of your salvation and the freedom that you've accomplished for us, this repentant heart has to take place. So God, help us celebrate this message well over the next few minutes and help us live this message out throughout the rest of this week. And uh, it's in Jesus' name. Uh, amen. Amen. Let's stand up and let's go to God.
with my eyes to see all the plans you have for me. I hope it. Uh, I hope it's good to be here again. If you're a believer in Jesus, haven't been baptized, we'd love to celebrate that with you. And so you can go sign up at the info desk. And uh, really, there are going to be some pretty practical steps each week over the course of this series as we just talk about some things that we're called to do now uh, because this message is true and real. And uh, and so we'd love to have you back next week. In fact, there's a week that's on the calendar. It's actually gonna be the last week of this series that's gonna lead us back into First Peter that I am just so excited about. I am just fired up. And uh, so I, I hope you go on this journey with us as we just talk about the church and uh, some different things that we're called to do that we see through in the scriptures. Um, so we love you. Uh, we hope you have a great week. Um, and we'll see you back next time, Sunday at 10 a.m.